We put out a call to all the young actors in Great Britain. He's <laughs> a man with a bell. Yes. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we, need, we need you. We practically was Blake and Schofield for that whole year. In, it, was in more, it was more a lifestyle choice than a job. <laughs> <It was. laughs> yeah, yeah. I loved the idea of writing a war movie where the fight was to stop a battle. We were using this, you know, some amazing te like technical gear, but it also felt like doing a kind of home video school play. <laughs> you would come up and say, I'm going to do it, I'm going to yeah. do it. Yeah. But that was really beneficial. Action would just mean sort of exist. And, uh, <laughs> you know, and That's then, a good one, I like that. You know. And exist. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And stop existing. Yeah. Yeah. That's good, yeah. I'm going to use that. This is Entertainment Weekly, it's Around the Table. Uh, hello, my name's Dean Charles Chapman. Hi there, my name's George Mackay. I'm Sam Mendes. Hi, I'm Christy wilson Cairns. I'm Roger Deakins. And we're going to be talking 1917 around this table of, uh, of high tea uh, here in a London hotel, which is slightly out of our reach, I notice. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's uh, frustrating. <laughs> tempting. Roger set uh, this whole thing up. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the inspiration for the film, um, these people around this table have heard this story a number of times now, um, so I'm going to let George tell the story, tell the story. That, that I always tell okay. uh, George. about my grandfather. Okay, well, well Sam's, uh, Sam's grandfather fought in the First World War, but he, um, well, as, as we, he, he, never, he never told his, his children about what happened, but it was his grandchildren, being Sam, who would, who would ask, well, I remember Sam saying that he used to ask his father about why his granddad used to wash his hands so much. Um, and he said that he, was, he, could never, he felt like he could never get his hands clean because he would always had the mud on the trenches, the mud of the trenches on his hands. And so Sam asking, asking the stories of his granddad and asking him to tell him, and finally his granddad felt like he could, and actually once he had an audience perhaps quite liked telling the stories and sharing them. But there was one particular one about a soldier being Sam's granddad, Alfred, delivering a message across no man's land. And, uh, and that just particular image of a, a very simple idea of a man trying to get from A to B in that environment was the seed that, you know, that, that sort of this, this film and this story grew. So you were listening all that time, you were yeah, listening. That was yeah, very detailed. That yeah, yeah. was very, very <laughs> impressive and kind of moving as well. <laughs> and, then, and then, Christy, how did that sort of manifest itself when, when uh, we started talking? By the time I brought the story to you, I'd written a treatment. Can you remember what the treatment was at that point? Um, well, I remember that image. I remember the idea of of someone having to deliver a message that like how fractured communication was it we spoke a lot about that in our first conversation and i remember some of the ideas that you had the plane crash um getting to stop an attack i loved the idea of writing a war movie where the fight was to stop a battle i thought that was really poignant that really resonated with me in that first call um and yeah i remember sitting around your kitchen table with all our World War One books being very nerdy. Well, you were cool. I was nerdy, of course. It looked um, just like this. Yeah, it looked as well. just. It was, it was, there was laid out a similar tea. Much, much more food. I think there were more cakes, food. but yeah. more yeah. lobster, as I recall. <laughs> um, yeah, you phoned me up and you said you told me the story of your grandfather and you said, you know, I want to, I want to co-write this with you. I danced. You couldn't see that. Um, <laughs> and then the last thing you said in that call was, oh, by the way, it's all going to be one shot. Then you kind of hung up on me. <laughs> Thanks for that. I was just left, left, you with it. left, just like, did I hear yeah. that right? Yeah, I just didn't want to ever hear anyone say, no, that's a bad <laughs> idea. So I used to drop it in, or I wrote it on the front page of the script. Yes. <laughs> what the hell are you doing, large couple? No, no, no! If you fail, it will be a massacre. When we finished the script, the first person I sent it to was Roger Deakins, uh, who I thought would have a, a couple of opinions about, A, the script, and B, the way in which we are going to shoot it. What did you think, Roger, when you got it? I thought it was a typo. Because <laughs> you didn't say anything about the concept. You just said it's a, it's a story set in World War I. I thought, oh, yeah, fantastic. And then the front page said, this is envisioned as a single shot. And I did. I thought it was a typo. <laughs> <laughs> or a way of selling a project right. rather than actually a... And then I read this, started reading the script, and it was obvious it's a real time, and it's always the movement, and it, it, it did seem to lend itself to that, you know, the concept. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, it made sense. Yeah. Of a sort. <laughs> and then, and then uh, you know, a few months later, uh, we didn't send you the, the whole script, because we no. were sending out scenes to all the young actors in 
We put out a call to all the young actors <laughs> in Great Britain. <laughs> yeah. man with the bell. Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we, need, we need you. Um, yeah, your country needs you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, your a big director picture of Sam. Right exactly. Now. <laughs> Come audition. And, uh, and I sent out because you know these days it's too. It's considered too. Well, it is too dangerous <laughs> to yeah. send out scripts because they they get out. And one of the things I didn't want to get out, obviously, was the whole one shot idea. But more yeah. importantly, the story. Um, which we won't give away now, but there are some pretty big twists and turns that you don't see coming. Yeah, um, I, rem I remember just getting. So it was just two two scenes that I got, and I, but I remember really clearly feeling, even without the context of the script, like I I felt like I knew Schofield, or at least like knew an interpretation that I wanted to to give. And uh, and the scenes were, were. I'm not just saying the scenes were written so beautifully. It was kind of it was lovely because it's. You know, which is always more fun as an actor as well. You know, it's, they, they never they never say what they're feeling. Yeah. You know, they never they never sort of go, well, I'm feeling like this. Mm -hmm. It was just you, but you could. I, I just I knew exactly what how he was feeling underneath, even without kind of knowing it. I mean, it's you know, it's um, you can you can know intuitively via kind of where they are in the scene that that something has happened before, and uh, and without knowing the specifics of it, I just kind of. I don't know, the, the tone really resonated with me. It's actually it's a good point. You know, there's very little exposition in the, in, the, in the script. So, you know, we find out about the characters through little chinks of information and we piece it together. And so, in fact, some of the biggest pieces of information come right at the end of the movie. Mm. The things that you would normally probably tell an audience right at the beginning of a movie. Mm. We wait until the very end. Um, but when, when Dean came in, Dean, uh, Dean auditioned in a whole different accent. He had a whole, a whole different take on it. Why, why, why was that? I'm interested. It was a very good accent, by the way. But yeah, it was Irish. Give it an Irish. Give it an Irish go. I don't know. I mean, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I don't know. I think I, uh, same as George, didn't get sent a script. Only the one scene, and it was the scene uh, where Blake tells Schofield the story about Wilco with a rat biting his ear off. Spoiler alert. <laughs> and, um, and yeah, it's just, I just thought, Jesus, this man's in the middle of a war zone in the First World War and he's able to tell his mate a funny story. And I just wanted to make him a little bit bubbly. I sort of got a good sense that he was a warm character. And I just sort of fixed it to an Irish accent. And, and you just done an Irish and accent? And I've just done an Irish accent well. for another role. So I thought, I'm kind of red hot at the minute <laughs> with, with the accent. I thought, I'll give that a go. And uh, I don't know if it was any good. It was it. good, yeah, it was yeah. good. Well, also, it was very interesting because it's, it's naturally softened you as well. It's funny that actually what you're saying about kind of the job that came before, because I think that it was the job that came before this that helped me know Schofield a little bit. Like, I remember being really exhausted, sort of physically and emotionally with this, this other job, and I remember the last two weeks of it going like, and, uh, you know, speaking to home, and I was speaking to, and I, I think, I, I remember saying, saying when I was, when I was calling home, I was like, I can't talk about it right now. I'll tell you when I get back because it's really like if I if I if I sort of if I leave this place now I, I won't I won't kind of come back to it and that's why I think the scenes with Schofield yeah. resonated so much because that's so much of who he is of yeah. like I'm here and I can do here but I can't be two places if you, at once. If you talk yeah. about but also if you think about home you're gonna you feel like you're gonna collapse. Yeah, you think yeah, yeah. about what waits for you home or, or the fact that you may never get back there um, then then you're not gonna be able to carry on. Yeah, which I think is a is a sort of continu continuing. Mm. aspect of, of Schofield during the course of the story. I'm going back to see my father. We need to keep moving! Come on! I'm going back no more to run. We can't possibly make it that way, man! You bloody insane! If you don't get there in time, we will lose 1,600 men. Your brother among them. Good luck. I mean, the challenge of the, the whole one shot of it, on the one hand, it needed to be constantly changing, and the relationship between the camera and the actors changes constantly, so it doesn't, on a simple level, become monotonous and repetitive, but it's this dance always between sometimes being subject to a very intimate with you guys and sometimes showing the geography and, and the distance. Sometimes it expresses physical difficulty, and some of the things they have to go through, sometimes time. It's constantly, obviously, the light's changing, the weather's changing. Um, and there are unknowns as well within there, animals, babies, um, the things, you know, you fall down, conditions, you know, you can stand up in the mud. Dean fell down 
Dean came a cropper a couple of times, times. yeah, times. and so did I. But I wasn't yeah. on camera, so it wasn't embarrassing for me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it was actually quite embarrassing. <laughs> yeah. um, so is that, but you know, he doesn't do anything bonkers. He doesn't go through keyholes or follow the path of a moving bullet. It's not, I, I, Roger and I talked a lot about it not being show off y, didn't we? And not like, like yeah, draw but, attention I mean, to itself. There's two things, though, isn't there? there there's this concept of, like you would do on any film, you know, in the morning you block with the actors and figure where do you want to put the camera to express the scene visually? Yeah. So basically we were just doing the same thing and the technical challenge was something else we didn't really think about until we figured out what we wanted to do with the camera and how we wanted to uh, allow the audience to see something the guys were seeing or not allow the audience yeah, to see quite. something they were seeing and build attention by not not experiencing yeah. that till later. Yeah, you know, a lot so. of it was about what the camera didn't see, exactly. Yeah. But, you know, uh, I, I, it always slightly amuses me that people say, you know, is it, there's a danger it could be a gimmick. And it's like, yeah. well, yeah, but look at it this way. We experience our lives as one long, continuous shot. That's how we live. That's yeah. how we walk through our life. It's editing that is the gimmick. Editing yeah, exactly. has become yeah. the grammar of film. You know, people go on and on about editing, um, and, and over the last 20 years, it's got more and more you know, intense with the advent of digital editing, but, but they haven't explored the equivalent distance, the equivalent in the other mm -hmm. direction, which is towards long, continuous, fluid takes, which experience action as we experience life. Yeah. You know, discuss. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny, like what you said about editing, I think the one thing that when people have asked us about the, you know, the, the long take, but it, it felt like the choreography that was you know, was, that was very exact. We were afforded a beautiful amount of time and therefore the way that they, you sort of craft and edit gradually, we just crafted the front end and that choreography which we stuck to, that was a process in itself to get to the steps. Like it wasn't, it wasn't like we turned up on day one in January and we're like, this is where you're walking, this is the path you're gonna take, mm -hmm. and this is where the camera's gonna go. It was like, okay, what feels right? How long should that pause mm. be? How fast do you wanna walk? Okay, cool, well, let's see how we can work mm. that. Then we'd go back, learn more about the characters through doing other aspects, and then come back to that one on a partially built set and go, okay, does that pace feel right? No, actually, no, that, that, that bit meant, you know, now I know that that bit means more to him, so that silence yeah. should sustain longer. And so all of that, that choreography that we then stuck mm. to and had to be strict, uh, had to be quite strict with, was actually so kind of organically crafted, it, it, we felt very free in that sort of... Yeah, in that, that's in what that, I always felt, that by the time we came to shoot, you weren't aware of the camera because mm. you were just doing the movement that was almost like, by rote now, it was something that was built memory. into the yeah. scene, the muscle memory. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it was always in sync with the camera because that was your timing. Mm. Yeah. And it never yeah. changed, so you could be the characters yeah. rather than be aware of the technique. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean that was you quite know, always, in a sense, what you're trying to encourage actors to do is to lose self-consciousness and not think, but yeah. concentration, but, but not thought. Yeah. And, um, and when you're having to use your body so much and literally mm. physically climb and move and you're knackered, you're not acting being knackered, you are knackered, <laughs> you, are knackered. Yeah, yeah, you know. Yeah. What, you're, what you're trying to do is this weird combination in a movie like this where you've got incredible precision on the camera moves and, and uh, the rigs and what have you, and yet you're encouraging spontaneity mm -hmm. and, and freedom in front of camera because you want those little accidents. You want people to feel that you're living through this, not acting it. Um, and, and so it, it's a, it, the balance of that was something we were very conscious of. You don't want to feel like you were constricted the whole time, like you were going on tram lines. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the way you put it is perfect, really, which is that you weren't presented with a map that that's where you're going to move. You know, <laughs> yeah. we were watching you, you were watching us. We were, and it was a constantly, it's kind of like a layering. Yeah. And the yeah, only yeah. big difference, I suppose, between this and a conventional movie, I mean, you know, Roger and I would prep a movie for six months as a matter of course, a, a big movie. Um, but in this case, we had the actors with us from day one. Mm -hmm. And not only were you with us, but you were, with, you were in full uniform. So yeah, if anyone yeah. had turned up to watch our rehearsals mm. on an empty field, <laughs> they thought we were a bunch of nutters <laughs> wandering around, you know, with like mm. one of those, those reenactors. You yes. know what I mean? I'm not yeah. saying anyone out there, if you're a reenactor, you're not a nutter. <laughs> but it is quite an eccentric thing <laughs> to do with your life. So, but, you know, it, it, that's what you look like. It's yeah. just, just yeah. two people reenacting yeah. the First World War in the middle of Salisbury Plain with. Miles from anywhere in the driving rain, yeah. Yeah. all of us in <laughs> puffer coats, you know, wandering around with scripts. That's actually what the rehearsals look like. And yeah. where you walked in, it's like, right, this is where the orchard starts, and someone would plant a flag. Yeah. And if there was an incident, like there was an incident in the trench or a scene, someone planted an orange flag, and yeah. your journeys became 
you know, yellow marker and your journey, journey became green That's markers. Right. And, yeah, got and you could say, so you could look across the land and, and you could see where Blake was going to go and where Schofield was going to go and where, uh, that's where they see the plane and that's where they go down in the crater. And then you start digging the crater and, you know, digging the mm. hole where you see the plane and digging the trenches. And, but you couldn't start any of that until we had our markers out on the land, could we? Yeah, no, no, no. It and was so weird watching that happen. <laughs> I can't tell you how incredibly mm. strange it was just to be running behind you with a laptop and like just, but also <laughs> it was somehow less weird because when we started, you used to do that like in your living room, in your garden, and I would just follow behind you and occasionally you made me do the dialogue and then you were like, no, <laughs> I'll, I'll do I've both parts, that. I'll do both parts. And so I was so used to kind of walk along beside you, listening to you <laughs> talk out entire scenes. I'm sorry, Chris. No, I loved I it, say. but it was very useful. And then wow. obviously, so it was, everything was built piece by piece. It was mm. really organic. It felt like, it felt like everyone working together, which yeah. was so nice. It was so, mm -hmm. I mean, even though it was a really kind of like harrowing story to write, actually the making of it felt like fun and wonderful. And, and I oh, look forward to work every day. Yeah, and it felt like it was kind of, we were using this, you know, some amazing te yeah. like technical gear, but it also felt like doing a kind of, Home video school play. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. In that but scene. What I remember was really great, or Sam saying, you guys being available in prep, mm -hmm. is I remember I had like weeks testing particular bits of equipment and how you put a camera on and off a technocrane and track it on a vehicle. And I was doing it with standing. You really didn't like that. You, you would come up and say, I'm going to do it, I'm going to yeah. do it. Yeah. But that was really beneficial because yeah. you understood and yeah. got familiar with the technical challenge and all that was going on around you, yeah, yeah. and then you could kind of ignore it. I got him. as well that like the conditions that we were actually filming in were so realistic to how it would have been. I always describe the mud in no man's land compared to walking on ice. That's how mm. slippy it was. And there's a bit in that sequence where the camera sort of lowers down and uh, onto Blake and Schofield's feet and our feet are just slipping everywhere. But that ain't us acting that. That's <laughs> us genuinely just trying to put one foot in front of the other. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. that, that I've never had an experience like that before. No. I mean, it, it was sort of trying to find the balance between having what an actor prepares, and we prepared a lot. Mm -hmm. But then also almost forgetting that and just seeing what happened on the day and trying to gel them two together. Yeah, I, I, th I think as well, and like what we're saying about kind of the emotional scenes and taking certain stuff home with you, this was a really healthy experience as an actor in terms of, it, it was kind of the best of both worlds in, in that it's that, that you have to have one foot inside, one foot outside. In terms of like when they're doing of it, you have to be completely there, and the immer and the length of the takes allowed you to get completely immersed. The sets were, you know, you you're in you're in the environment. You can't see anyone else. Mm -hmm. You you are doing that journey and feeling everything that is going on in the scene. But then by the same token, the kind of the fact that we were party to the crafting of that beforehand helped you have a sort of more three dimensional view of it, which just frankly for your head and your heart is healthier at the end of the day to kind of leave work there. But that said, obviously, the parts came to us and we came to the parts over the making of it. So it was sort of, we were probably more immersed than we even realised, I reckon. Mm. Yeah. Um, but and, we, and we was immersed six months before we even started shooting. <laughs> yeah. We, we practically was Blake and Schofield yeah. for that whole year. In, it was more, in the first it was more a lifestyle choice than a <laughs> <It was. laughs> yeah. yeah, it was. Do you know what? I'm not just saying it. Obviously, we were making a film. But I, you know, in those scenes, I forgot we were making a film. Yeah. You yeah. was just in it and that was it. And the thing is, these one takes, I think the longest take we did was nine minutes. And as an actor, you really do just get lost in it, don't you? Yeah. And you, and you kind of like, I don't know, that was one thing you were... I, uh, the, the sort of wonderful direction that we that, that you gave it to us a few times, and then it sort of I think we just it got under our skin in in that way of like just just throw it away, just be natural, just kind of just have the thought, take it all in, mm -hmm. and, and that way that once you start doing that and you kind of have the trust of all being together, of that you know that you know that, 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 that like the, the team is with you, you just kind of you just start looking around and you just start having the thoughts that they'd be having, and you know the characters mm -hmm. so well that you start start thinking as them. 
So you look at someone and you sort of have Schofield's reaction to them, yeah. and then you sort of look down there. You go, oh right, that that reminds me of the memory that I, you know, that has sort of been built over the last few months. Mm -hmm. And it was just sort of really lovely to be like, action would just mean sort of exist. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and that's then, a good one. I like that. You know. And <laughs> exist. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. stop existing. Yeah. Yeah. That's that good. That. I'm yeah. going to use that. Well, most of the time when I say cut, you couldn't hear me anyway because you're miles away. <laughs> yeah. So I had to have someone relay cut. Yeah. There were a couple of times when it was, I was trying to stop you in the middle of a take. It was no good. <laughs> <laughs> like, ah, like this, and just chatting away, talking, you're know, running Sharing somewhere, doing, yeah. uh, handling your weapons. I don't know what you were doing. <laughs> Not a week, we but, were existing. <laughs> but what, what was it like sparing your presence? We had a bunch of other young actors yeah. on the movie yeah. who'd done a couple of uh, uh, inexperienced, I think. Yeah. Yeah, but they did well. Colin yeah, Firth, the young actor Colin Firth. Yeah, I had to have a few words with Colin just to yeah. you know, give him some notes. Just, just give him some tips. You know, so. <laughs> uh, Benedict Cumberbatch, yeah. you know, promising also, yeah. I think. And <laughs> Andrew Scott may have a future. Uh, Richard Madden, yeah, you know, but, it's all right. yeah, he's very good looking. Yeah. He's uh, very good but I cast looking. him to be your elder brother, so oh, obviously no. he had very, very high standards. The thing standards is, as well, when, when you told me as well Richard was going to play my brother, I thought, I look nothing like Richard Madden. And then the first time I met him in the costume department, I thought, oh my God. And see, it was I thought, Nice casting. <laughs> <laughs> nice work. So. It's like looking in a mirror. But they all came, didn't they? Completely on it and completely prepared, and nobody. Yeah. And they all came to rehearsals too. Mm. I mean, how did it feel for you? You know, you, you, in a sense, knew more about the film than they did, even though they were more experienced. Actors. I was just blown away because the sort of, when you read when you read the script and read another actor's role, you sort of have your own imagination about what they're going to bring to it. And like Andrew Scott, for instance, <coughs> he, you know, in the film, he looks like he's been there for years, and I hadn't have read that, it that way. Mm. But you know, the detail they brung. You know, to their own performance and what they brought to the roles just blew me away. Yeah, the same. Yeah, the specificity of all of them and what what I loved about, you know, listening to the discussions that that we all had and that you, you like mainly that you had with them and and what they wanted to do with the roles as well is the com like, is the complexity of life as well in terms of rather than have this general who was a kind of bloodthirsty upper class mindless man, he's just kind of go no, that ever he's got a mission. This is the information that he has. He's he's kind of. He's got. He's there's. He is bound as much as we are bound by him. And yeah, and this is probably the most practical way of doing it. And if all he has is pragmatism well, yeah. at this time, I, I felt like they all needed to be lost in the fog of war and trying mm. to find their way through. And they're all people who are convinced they know the truth, but a hundred yards away, is someone who thinks completely differently. Yeah. And and neither is right, and neither is wrong, and and we don't know, and neither do you. You know, you meet Colin Firth at the beginning saying. You know, well, the Germans have gone, they've abandoned, you know. And the 200 yards away you meet Andrew Scott who says, no, they haven't, that's nonsense, it's a trap. And you don't know what the reality is. And that's only possible in this particular war or wars before it. And, and I was very conscious that each person, an audience should feel, yeah, that they, they, it feels to me like they're right. It mm. feels to me like I would believe him. Oh no, maybe yeah. I would believe him. Yeah. You know, everyone has to be equally credible and everyone has to be equally lost. In yeah. a way. Yeah. And even when you get to the end, you get to Mackenzie and you say, you know, you, you know, he, there was a pressure a little bit to turn him into this sort of Colonel Kurtz mm -hmm. figure who'd gone rogue, you know, and he was a nutter and he was just sending people over. And actually, he's also just struggling to do the best he can, you know. And, and, I, and I thought that, that made, uh, brought everyone into a kind of, um, you know, on to, to, to a same, similar human level to you guys. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, everyone's just struggling to do the same, to, to, to work out the same answers to the same questions, mm -hmm. don't you think? Yeah, everyone's the hero of their own story in it. Everyone's trying to do the right thing with the information they have, and, and I think that's reality. Mm -hmm. What we were trying to do is kind of make a film that's like 108 minutes in someone else's life, right? And, mm -hmm. and so as you move through your own life, you never meet someone who go, well, they're the villain. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like You're, ne you're never in a, a conversation with like, I'm the villain here, I'm the antagonist. And so that was the only way to tell this story, was to be real, to, to like, you know, glance along that line of reality as much as possible. Yeah. Mm. I always thought it'd be kind of it'd be really interesting to make a series of films <laughs> in this in the same two hours that this story's told, but just with every character, you know, and spend two hours then with yeah. it, and that, that we sort of almost met at the same point within the journeys. But as because as you say, everyone's living their own mm. life, everyone's come through, you know, what they've come through before then and will go on to what they do afterwards. Mm. It's um yeah, yeah Ra the Rashomon version of it, you know. Mm. 1917 Part 2, starring Mark Strong. <laughs> yeah. 1917 Part 3, yeah. starring Benedict Cumberbatch. Yeah. Well, they're all, they're all on their, what they consider life and death missions. You know, yeah. no, one, no one else, you know, none of them 
Exactly, as Christy says, they're all, they're all heroes in their own stories. Mm. Mm. This has been Entertainment Weekly's Round the Table. We've all been discussing our new movie, 1917. Please check it out. Opens in some markets, Christmas Day and others on January the 10th. We hope you enjoy it very much.